checked out for this evening, and he might need a little help. I'm not sure how many I gave him, but if somebody else wants to uh, help Tony, Tony, have you already passed those out? A lot of them. Does anybody need one? Anybody else need one? Raise your hand if you don't have one. Okay, thank you, Elsie. Let us know in a moment if you did not get one of the handouts because it will be very helpful in following as we continue to look at the seven congregations of Asia. Remember, we, we've been dealing with an introduction to the book of Revelation. Really, looking at the seven congregations is going to end that introduction. So after this quarter, we'll be through with the introduction to Revelation. We may in times in the future come back to Revelation looking at different things, but we'll be ending the study. And I think that's a good way to end because chapters 2 and 3, those seven congregations, so much by way of practical information and application for us. If you'll remember a few years back, we did a uh, series Sunday night on the seven congregations. And we tried to look at it a little bit differently. Every lesson, of course, we had entitled something different. But remember, to Ephesus, we entitled that Rekindle the Love. Rekindle the Love. And then to the church at Smyrna, remember the reward. And then as we looked at Pergamos, it was restore the doctrine. And Thyatira, as we look at her tonight, recapture the purity. And Sardis, what we entitled it, was renew the vigilance. And of course, the church at Philadelphia, redeem the opportunities. And the church at Laodicea was revive the fire or the zeal. And all of those titles represent something critical within each one of those congregations. So remember that tonight, recapture the purity. We're going to begin by reading Revelation 2. And we're going to be reading, of course, that concerning Thyatira. We'll begin in verse 18. We'll read through the end of the chapter, verse 29. So let's read it in its entirety. Then we'll come back and, and make points concerning each one of these verses. But beginning in verse 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and cause those who commit adultery with her, uh, excuse me, and, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the heart. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you, I, uh, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put no burden, other burden on you. Look at verse 25. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes... Uh, and keeps my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also receive from my Father. 
and I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I put in your handout some information concerning Thyatira. I don't really want to go over that right now. That's for your information. But please hold on to that. Please keep it. It is very, very valuable. The one thing that I will mention at the end of that handout, it mentions that Thyatira had more trade guilds of any city her size. Now, why is that important? Because at this time in the Roman Empire, if you were not, of course, received by Rome, then you couldn't buy, sell, or get gain. And it was so important in these trade guilds uh, to have a part in them. Again, if you wouldn't pinch the incense once a year, say Caesar is Lord, you couldn't be a part of the trade guilds. Thus, you couldn't make a living. You couldn't buy, sell, and get gain. That was part of the economic tribulation that they were going through. And so the brethren here in Thyatira, as in all of these seven congregations, they had it pretty tough. Uh, things were not like they are for us today. We like to, at times, throw ourselves a pity party. I'll guarantee you this, if we were back in this day, we'd be longing to be here with what we have, the blessings, the security, even within this nation. But that being said, let's go back to this text. Let's begin looking at this verse by verse. And, and if you have a question, if you have a comment, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. Read with me verse 18. Now remember, all of these letters start the same way. It says, And the angel of the church in Thyatira write. All the letters start like that. The only change from that first sentence is the different congregation. The angel of the church at Ephesus. The angel of the church at Smyrna. So this keeps that sevenfold letter design intact. And the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. The Son of God. You remember back in chapter 1 and verse 13, when John looks, he sees one like the Son of Man. Both of these designations, so powerful as they apply to Jesus. He is the Son of Man. He is the Son of God. You remember in Matthew 16, when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? And of course, the apostles answered. They said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus gets up close and personal. He says, But who do you say that I am? It's not enough to know who man says Jesus is. Who do you say he is? And of course, that's when Peter speaks up. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Son of God. Again, he's the Son of man. He's the Son of God. Who better to intercede on our behalf? Who better to mediate between the two, between man and God? The Son of man the Son of God. And notice this, he has eyes. The next thing that he says, we've got eyes like a flame of fire. Now remember back in chapter 1, we see that in verse 14, and we stated at that time that that's probably referring to his penetrating vision. He sees all. He sees through everything. You can try to deceive him. You know, remember... Uh, Galatians 6 and verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Uh, we can try to deceive him, but all we're really doing when we do that is we're deceiving ourselves. He's not deceived. If we think we can deceive him, put something over on him, we're deceived. Proverbs 15 and verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are every place, beholding the evil and the good. So these eyes that the Son of God has they're like a flame of fire, penetrating vision. And he has feet, notice this, like fine brass. 
Write down a reference here, Micah 4 and verse 13. Read that later on. It talks about hooves of bronze. And so it's talking about the same thing, these feet of bronze, feet of brass. That represents in this context the power to trample. This one who sees all, he has the power to subdue the enemies. He has the power to trample. Feet like brass. And so again, notice if you will, verse 19, it goes on to say, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Jesus, again, to every congregation says, I know. He is omniscient. Remember, this is the Son of God. This is the one who sees. This is the one who knows. He knows them intimately. Remember Psalm 139? Before there is a word on our tongue, thou knowest it altogether. And it goes on before that, intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And, and then the response is, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. That's what the psalmist writer is talking about. He is noticing, understanding, viewing the omniscience of God that he knows words on our tongue before we even say them, that once again, he, he knows us intimately, and he says, this kind of knowledge is too wonderful for me, and likewise for me, you, it's too high. I cannot attain it. No, we never will. But the Son of God can say, I know because he does. And then he lists what he knows. Notice, I know your works. That's just a very general term there. He says your love. Some translations say charity. I know your works. I know your love, your service, or some translations, ministry. Again, your faith, or again, fidelity. Jesus knows all of this about them. And notice what he goes on to say, and your patience. Remember what we said. They are suffering tribulation. They are having a very difficult time, yet they are still working. They are still loving. They are still serving. Notice that. They're still doing what they ought to do. And here's a great, great compliment. Look what he says at the end of verse 19. And as for your works, now he's already mentioned their works, and now it's sort of, this again is sort of compiling everything he's just said. As for your works, as for these things that I've mentioned, he says the last are more than the first. Now, remember... This is very, the very opposite of what happened in Ephesus. They had left their first love. It was less, okay? Their, their love now was less than it was at the first. They left first love. That's not the case here. It is more than at the first. And what a tremendous compliment. They were doing more. You remember, look up that word more sometime, and, and you remember in Isaiah 5 and verse 4, God asked his people the question. He asked them, what more could I have done for you that I haven't already done? And of course, the answer to that is, Lord, you couldn't have done anything more. You couldn't have. Remember Matthew 5 and verse 47, what do you more than others, Jesus asked? And so, very good question. What about my works? What about your works? Are they more now than they were at the first? Do we imitate Thyatira in that, or are we like Ephesus? No, those first works, we've sort of left those. That first love, it's, it's not that intense anymore. You remember 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1 and verse 10? Excel still more. And so when you look at Thyatira, their love, that's one of the things he mentioned, their love was more than it was at first. 
And so think with me for just a moment. I've made this point before, and I think it's so valid. I think it's one of the, the main lessons we have to take out of these two chapters. When you think about Ephesus, they had a proper hatred. Remember in Revelation 2 and verse 6, you know, he says, you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which deeds I also hate. Jesus commended Ephesus for their hatred, but he rebuked them for their love. You've left your first love. So their hatred was right, their love wasn't. You know, I used to think a long time ago that if I could have the proper love that I should have, that my hatred would just sort of fall into place too, and even vice versa. If I had the proper hatred, that would mean necessarily that I had the proper love. I don't believe that anymore because of what we're looking at. Ephesus had the proper hatred. They were commended for it, but they were rebuked for their lack of love. Thyatira here is just the opposite. They had love like they should. Their love was increasing. It was more than it was at the first. But we're going to see in the very next verse, their hatred for evil was not what it should be. They tolerated that Jezebel woman. They allowed that Jezebel woman. And so think about this. Here's a congregation, Ephesus. Their love was wrong, but their hatred was right. Here's a congregation, Thyatira. Their love was right, but their hatred was wrong. Now, we don't have to ask the question, well, which congregation are we going to be like? We don't want to be like either one of them. We want to get it right, okay? We want the, the love to be what it ought to be, like it is in Thyatira, and we want the hatred of wrong to be what it ought to be, like it was in Ephesus. Both have to be right. We have to make sure that both are right. Don't ever think, well, if I hate evil like I should, that means I'm okay with love. Or if I love like I should, that means that I'm okay with the hatred. Now, remember what the Bible says in Hebrews 1 and verse 9? Here's the key. Ephesus is not our example. Thyatira is not our example. Our blessed Lord is our example. We're to walk in His footsteps. 1 Peter 2 in verse 21. And remember what was said about Jesus, Hebrews 1 in verse 9. He loved righteousness. He hated lawlessness. Jesus had it right. Jesus got it right. He loved what he should love, righteousness. He hated what he ought to hate, lawlessness, sin, iniquity, transgression. But I find that interesting with Thyatira. Her love was commended. Really, she's the only one of the seven congregations that the Lord commends for their love. But look, if you will, verse 20. After he commends them, after he says, you know what? Your, your works are more than they were at the first. What a great compliment. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. This term here, you allow. Some translations say you tolerate. It literally means to let be. You let this woman be. It means to permit. You permit this woman to do these things. And it also means to leave alone. You leave this woman alone as she's doing these things. And so we can see here again that they permitted her teaching to go on unrebuked, uncondemned. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 13 what was said about that wicked man? Remove that wicked man from among yourselves. Well, obviously, that's what Jesus is stating here. She shouldn't be allowed to do that. And he's going to let him know in just a moment, even though you allow her to do these things, I will not. I will not. I will punish her. 
I will take care of this. And so they allowed her to do this. Notice what she was doing. She, again, was teaching and seducing. And what was she teaching? What was she seducing them to do? Well, to commit sexual immorality, to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, most people agree that this is probably literal, okay? One of the things that we mentioned in the city of Thyatira, and it was not unique to Thyatira, that in the temples of the pagan gods and in accordance with their trade guilds and their meetings that they would have, many times it was a place of drunkenness, a place of riotous living, a place of immorality. And so they were allowing that. They were allowing her to encourage that, allowing her to teach that. Others say, well, it's probably more figurative uh, you go to the Old Testament, and many times God says that His people were unfaithful. He was married to them, as you see in Jeremiah, the third chapter. But they'd gone after lovers, idols. They were idolaters. And, of course, that's being used symbolically. But, again, whether it's literal or symbolic, the Lord is saying, I've got a problem with this. If it's literal, they were doing these things literally. If it's symbolic, this is all tied to idolatry and thus not being faithful to their husband, the Christ. You remember Paul says in 2 Corinthians the 11th chapter 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3, I espoused you to one husband as a pure virgin. And so they weren't faithful to the Christ. Why? Because they're allowing this Jezebel woman. She calls herself a prophetess. Notice God doesn't. She hung that banner on herself. But again, think about Jezebel herself. Jezebel was the idolatrous wife of Ahab. If you go to 1 Kings, the 16th chapter, you'll, you'll read about Ahab, and you'll read that, you know, even though sin was trivial to him, he even took it a step farther and he married Jezebel. <laughs> That's the implication. He went that low. He married Jezebel. These two were not good for each other. It wasn't just Jezebel. It was Ahab too. Remember in 1 Kings 21 and verse 25, surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. Well, just like Jezebel, the literal woman Jezebel incited, seduced her own husband to do things that were ungodly, wrong. This woman, Jezebel, is doing the same to the saints in Thyatira. Now here's something interesting to think about. Some say that if this is a literal person, that obviously her name was not Jezebel. And I would agree with that. If this is a literal person, then her name wouldn't be Jezebel. What mother in their right mind would name their daughter Jezebel? It's probably a pseudonym. You remember we talked about Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam in Pergamos, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You go back and you look at the etymology of those words, what they mean. Both words, Balaam and Nicolaitans, it means to conquer the people. So the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, it was a doctrine that would conquer the people. And Antipas, Antipas, the name means against authority. That martyr that Jesus says, my faithful martyr, Antipas, anti and from praetor, against father, and by extension against authority, Here's a man that was faithful to Christ. He went against the authority that was in Pergamos. You remember, in Pergamos, Jesus was saying, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. This is where Satan's power is, but this one, Antipas, a pseudonym, he went against that authority, lost his life for it, but he was faithful to the Lord. And so, it could be, now I'm emphasizing this, it could be that Jezebel, it's not referring to an individual at all. 
It, it may be just another name for a, a false doctrine like the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Again, the reason I say that, look what it says in verse 24. Look what it says in verse 24. And we'll get to this in a moment also, but it says, Now to the rest I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. So it's pointing to a doctrine. There are those in Thyatira that don't have this doctrine. So it could be that Jezebel, like I said, is used like unto the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but nevertheless, isn't it interesting that her name is used? It's a perfect analogy. Just as Jezebel incited her husband to do evil, this one or this group who is presenting this doctrine is doing the same thing to the brethren in Thyatira. Now, look if you will. Go to the next verse with me. Look at verse 21. It says, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Some translations, I gave her space to repent. You know, that's what the Lord wants us to do. We've all sinned, and we've all come short of His glory, Romans 3 and verse 23. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. God says concerning this, when I gave her space, I gave her time to repent, the problem was she didn't want to. Some translations say she didn't want to repent of her immorality. I think the New American Standard states it like that. But she didn't repent. Go to Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21, and you'll see that they did not repent. Go to Revelation 16. And I think it's about verses 4 and following. Two times, again, when the bowls are poured out, they did not repent. That's the problem in Revelation. They're not going to repent. Those who are doing the wrong, who are doing the evil, God wants them to repent, but they're not going to. Write down a verse. Jeremiah 8 and verse 6. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Now, I think that's an important verse when you talk about repentance because it tells me if I'm going to repent, if you're going to repent, we have to ask ourselves a question. And the question in looking at our lives is, what have I done? You know, when you examine self as we're taught to do, you see that I'm engaged in something that's, that's wrong. What have I done? You know, godly sorrow works repentance. It leads us to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and following. And so there has to be that godly sorrow before we're going to repent. And there has to be that time that looking at our lives and sorrowful over what we've done, we've got to say, what have I done? And also write down Romans 2 and verse 4. It's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. We have to say, in essence, what have I done? I have committed sin against my God, and my God has just been good to me. That's all He's ever done. It's His goodness that leads me to repentance. It, it helps me find and come to that point in my life that I want to repent. Why? Because I violated the, the law of a God who intended that law only for my good. But she would not repent. This, quote, Jezebel woman, God gave her time. She said, no, no thank you. Look at verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Again, just like Thyatira, they're allowing this. God says, oh, no, no, I will not allow this. If they don't repent of this, then I'm going to take care of it. I'll deal with it. You know, when you start in verse 22, going through the next three verses, there are going to be four different classifications, if you will, of people, okay? There's going to be the Jezebel woman. And God says, here's what I'm going to do to her. I'm going to put her on a sickbed, okay? Then there are those in verse 22 who commit adultery with her. They're going to go into great tribulation. 
Now, what that means, commit adultery with her, it's probably the ones who, like her, are espousing this doctrine, are teaching this doctrine. And so, again, look what it says in verse 23. I will kill her children. Now, please understand, this is not the killing of literal children. We're in a symbolic book. God says, I'm going to deal with Jezebel, okay? The one who's promoting that false doctrine. I'll deal with those also who are committing adultery with her. Anyone else teaching this doctrine, I'll deal with them. And I'll kill her children. What this means is those who believe this doctrine, those who are produced because of this doctrine. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 and 15? He says, I don't write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as beloved children. And he says, though you might have all kinds of teachers, you only have one father, I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul uses that term for his brethren in Corinth. You're my children. I've begotten you by the gospel. Jezebel is saying to these people, you're my children. I have begotten you through this false doctrine. You remember 3 John verse 4? I have no greater joy than this, than to know that my children are walking in the truth. Again, that's probably not talking about his literal children. It's talking about children that he has taught, that he has begotten, produced by teaching the truth. No greater joy than to know that those that were taught are still walking in the truth. So he says, I'll kill her children. That's the third group. I'll kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the heart, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. That's the way that God's always dealt with us, hasn't he? We're going to be judged on that last day according to the deeds done in our body, whether they be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Look at verse 24. Here's the fourth group that he refers to. It says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. So there's Jezebel herself, and those with Jezebel who are promoting this doctrine, teaching this doctrine. There are those who have been produced because of this doctrine. They believed it, now they're you're practicing it. But there's a group that hasn't, hasn't believed this doctrine. They don't have this doctrine. And look what it goes on to say. Uh, as many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden. I think that's interesting. The depths of Satan. You know, Gnosticism would say that they had deeper things. Their approach to the Christian in the first century was, well, you just have the scripture. We're, we're deeper than that. We, we know deeper things. And so this is probably, once again, a cryptic rebuke, if you will, who have not known the depths of Satan as they say. They call it depths, but it's not deep anyway. It's pablum, it's foolishness, it's error, it's falsehood. It's going to cost their soul if they continue in it. But notice this, the depths of Satan, contrast that with a verse in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, because here's our choice as we go through life. We're either going to know the depths of Satan, or we can know this. Look at 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. I want to know the deep things of God, and, and we can because they've been revealed to us. I don't want to know the deep things of Satan, as they say. But we're going to have to make a choice. And once again, as you look at Thyatira, Jesus speaks of their deeds, and he speaks of my works, his works. Once again, we're going to have to make a choice. Are we going to engage in her works or his works? Are we going to believe the deep things of God or are we going to be seduced into the depths of Satan? 
Look what he goes on to say in verse 25. But hold fast what you have till I come. And look at verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I'll give power over the nations. Stop here for a moment. You know, when he talks about in verse 26, he who overcomes overcomes in this particular context involves two things. Who is it who overcomes? Well, it's one in verse 25 who holds fast. That's who's going to overcome. The one who holds fast what you have until I come. And then secondly in verse 26, and keeps my works until the end. And so that's what it means to overcome. It means to hold fast. It means to hold fast, Jesus says, until I come. Remember, he is coming in the book of Revelation to deal with Rome, the enemy. You hold fast until I come. And what else? Well, you keep my works to the end. What did he tell the church at Smyrna? You be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Hear the promise, notice, I will give power over the nations. Go back and think about this. To the church at Ephesus, I will give to eat of the tree of life. That's what he says, I will do. I will give to eat of the tree of life. To Smyrna, I will give a crown of life. To Pergamos, uh, I will give you to eat of the hidden manna. And now the promise, again, look at this, I will give power over the nations. Look at this next verse, verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. This is quoting from Psalm 2. Psalm, the, the second psalm is a messianic psalm. It's really showing the reign of Christ, okay? Okay. And even in this book, Revelation 3 and verse 21, notice what it says here. Revelation 3 and verse 21, because this is the promise that they will reign, they will rule with Jesus. He is on his Father's throne, okay? He's granted to sit with his Father on his throne. We will be granted to sit with him if we overcome. Look at verse 21 of Revelation 3. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So this is a promise that we can reign with him. In Revelation 6, verses 9 and 10, they, they were put to death. They were under the altar. But in Revelation 20, verses 4 and following, those who were under the altar are now living and reigning with Christ. They overcame. And notice what this says. The rod of iron, you know, some say, well, this is the royal scepter. The sign, if you will, of, of royalty, of authority, of power. Others say this is the shepherd's rod, which used for many reasons, one of the reasons to defend the sheep from the enemy. And even others have said this is the potter's rod, the potter, after making a vessel, would measure with the rod that vessel. If it wasn't to specifications, he would shatter it into shivers. He would break it. Well, it's probably a combination of thought of all of this. But notice, this is not saying that Jesus has a tyrannical rule. That's not the point at all. The point is that his reign is invincible. He has power and authority, and no power can oppose him. If they oppose him, they're going to go down. They'll go down to their own defeat. Because this one, Jesus Christ, has that rod of iron. And so look what it says in verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. I don't know everything that this means. I know it's so significant. I think it's a deeper personal relationship with the Christ having gone through this trial. But look at this. Look, if you will, at chapter 22 and verse 16. I do know what, it, what the morning star means. 
what it is that Jesus promises them that he'll give them. Look at this. Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 16, it says in this context, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things uh, uh, in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Jesus, it's one of these promises like to, to Laodicea. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. He's going to give of himself this special reign, rule, authority. We'll share it with Jesus. And verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, you think about that, we, we have ears. We have ears. And God gave us those ears to hear. We need to hear these lessons. They're practical, they're powerful, they give us motivation, inspiration, they provide insight for us in our daily life. The whole point is, whatever you're facing, whatever the obstacle, whatever the opposition, you just remain true to Jesus Christ. You keep His works. You overcome, you hold fast to the end. And again, the promise is that joint rule, if you will, as the book of Revelation sets it forth. Just like he sat down with his father, we can sit down with him. Thank you for your attention. Next week, Lord willing, Wednesday, we're going to jump into chapter 3. That means we'll be dealing with the congregation at Sardis. Please read the first few verses of chapter 3. Let's be looking at the congregation of Sardis.